Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Women and Children First, a virtual edition. My name is Sarah Hollenbach. I am the co-owner of Women and Children First. We are one of the last feminist bookstores left in the United States. And we are so excited um, to have Michelle Falkoff and Rachel DeWaskin here with us tonight to celebrate Michelle's new book, How to Pack for the End of the World. What a perfect book for 2020. Um, I am joining you actually from the closet of women and children because we are actually open um, and there are customers outside. So um, that is why it is not very attractive where I'm sitting. But we are so excited to have this virtual event. And I also want to begin our virtual events as we begin all of our events um, in the bookstore with a land acknowledgement. So please join me in acknowledging that the land on which our bookstore stands is the seas occupied unceded territory of the Peoria, the Potawatomi, the Miami, and the Sioux people. We encourage all of you to learn more about land acknowledgement and the rightful owners of the land where you are viewing tonight's event um, at native-land.ca. Thank you all so much. Women and Children First, although partially open here in Chicago, is going to continue all of our events virtually um, through the middle of 2021, it looks like. Now I keep on moving that date off. Um, but we are so, so thrilled that people from all parts of the world are able to join us virtually and carry on this important tradition of celebrating new author releases. Uh, new books by and new books by authors we love and adore like Michelle Falkoff. So a few housekeeping notes. If you would like to ask a question tonight, please use the ask a question box located at the bottom of your screen. If you haven't bought a book already, please click that really awesome buy the book box also located at the bottom of the screen and that will connect you to womenandchildrenfirst.com. Now on to tonight's event. Rachel DeLaspin is the award-winning author of five novels, Sunday Will Fly, The Banshee, Blind, Big Girl Small, um, and the After Me. She has received a National Jewish Book Award, a Sydney Taylor Book Award, and an American Library Association Alex Award, among many others. Two of her books, Thorn Babes in Beijing and Banshee, are being developed in Hollywood for television. DeLaskin's poetry collections, Two Menus, was published by the University of Chicago Press um, this year. Uh, DeLaskin is also an associate professor of practice in the arts at UChicago and an affiliate, affiliated faculty member in Jewish and East Asian studies. Michelle Falkoff is the author of The Playlist for the Dead, Pushing Perfect, Questions I Want to Ask You, and Now, How to Pack for the End of the World. Her fiction and reviews have been published in the Harvard Review, Salon, and elsewhere. She is a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and, as, and serves as Director of Communications and Legal Reasoning at Northwestern. Um, how to Pack for the End of the World is so thoughtful, so um, layered in its ability to capture the very real fears and anxieties of today's young people. And it also so beautifully layers in the passions and investment and activism of, of those same young folks. Um, it has so much power, and she really does such, Michelle does such a beautiful job of watching the students and following these students as they come into their power and own their power. Um, I read this book over the last several days, and it was such a perfect time to read both the fear of the end and the hope for a new tomorrow. So please help me in welcoming Michelle Falkoff and Rachel DeWaspin.
Hi. Hello. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> this is amazing. It's so hard not to just like read the chat. It's it's like a, a who's who of everyone I've known since I was three years old. It's so it's great. It's one of the great silver linings. Mm -hmm. Everybody's <laughs> here from all over the place to celebrate your fabulous, complicated wow. novel. Do you want to give everybody what they're dying for and just read a brief excerpt before we no, talk they're not about dying all for that at all? <laughs> <laughs> I will do that, but I, I am going to keep it short. I think that readings in this platform can be can be endless. But um, what I'll read is a very uh, a, a, like maybe a three or so minute excerpt from the beginning of the second chapter, just to give a sense of um, Amina, my narrator's voice, and sort of the concerns that she has coming into the book. The nightmare wasn't the same every time. Sometimes it started with me and my family sitting at Friday night services at our synagogue, Temple Emmanuel. I'd be listening to the cantor sing, staring at the Hebrew words above the ark that translated to know before whom you stand. The bronze fixture that held the Ner Tamid, the eternal light, hung right above the ark, and I could see the tiny fire blazing in it. And then the fire blazed more brightly, and then it wasn't contained by the fixture, and before I had time to realize what was happening, the walls had caught fire and the screaming began. That wasn't real though. In another dream, my family wasn't there. It was me and my friends in one of the classrooms across the hall from the sanctuary, waiting for the rabbi's wife to come and begin our Hebrew school class. Until high school started, I'd gone three times a week despite my protests. The Rebetzin was never late. So even in the dream, I knew something was wrong. In this version, I smelled the smoke before I ever saw the flames, and I ran to the door only to find it locked from the outside, the handle so hot it singed my fingers. It was only when one of the boys kicked it down that we saw fire everywhere, with no path for us to escape. That wasn't real either. None of the versions I dreamed were real, because I hadn't been anywhere near the temple when it burned. No one had been, except the rabbi and a man he'd been counseling after the death of the man's wife. They'd met in the rabbi's office after the daily minion ended, despite the fact that there had been arson attempts at several local synagogues in recent weeks. My mom had been at the minion as she had been every night since my grandfather died six months before the fire, nearly two years ago now. She'd left the temple less than half an hour before the fire started. The rabbi and the man he was counseling would ultimately be fine. They'd suffered mostly from smoke inhalation, but the temple itself needed a tremendous amount of repair. I'd seen pictures of the scorched sanctuary and the sooty classrooms in the newspaper. I knew it could have been worse, but all I could think about was how my mother had been there only moments before some awful man, someone they'd never caught, had thrown a Molotov cocktail through the stained glass window that spanned the back wall of the sanctuary. She could have died. The thought of it left me breathless and sent my brain into nightmare creation overdrive. My therapist said my subconscious had taken the images I saw and combined them with everything I was afraid of to make dreams that were worse than reality. And I was sure she was right, but that knowledge was insufficient to make the dreams stop. It's just, I think, enough to give a sense of, of kind of who Amina is and what she's scared of um, and the things that she's struggling with that ultimately made her parents decide to send her to boarding school to kind of get away from the things she was dealing with at home and start over. So as you know, I love that section. And part mm -hmm. of the reason I love it is because I think it reveals something profound in the thinking of the book. And it's something about the relationship between what's real and what's imaginary. And of course, this is a consideration for writers of fiction, right? Because mm -hmm. in some way we exercise our worst fears in our books. And the kids in this book put together what's fundamentally a fictional exercise, right? They play this elaborate, extremely profound game in order to kind of act out their fears and also to build protections against them. So can you talk about that relationship for you as a writer, for the kids at the center of the story here, what's real and what's imagined and whether we can make clear distinction between the two? Yeah, I mean, it's a really complicated question and I don't think it's, I mean, obviously it's one that's that's not easy to answer in any sort of coherent way, but um, I think that, you know, we use fiction to explore reality, right? Like we, we use things that aren't real to try to get a better understanding of things that are real. Um, and one thing that I think we're all kind of seeing in the world is that um, 
the fact that something is real doesn't make it realistic. Um, yeah. And that's a constant tension that we all have to deal with. I, I'm sure you've all seen on social media the the writers making fun of, of real events by saying that that wouldn't fly in workshop or that we're in the wrong timeline or whatever. You know, there's this real blurriness between um, the way that we think about fantasy worlds and the way we think about reality and what's happening to us in our world right now. Um, and that was something that was very much on my mind as I was starting to write this. Um, and obviously things have escalated tremendously since the events that even gave rise to me starting to write this. Um, but they've only, they've only gotten more complicated and more of what they are. Um, all of those, all of those things that happened that felt very unrealistic, um, it, it, the only way to make them sort of feel manageable to me was to try to write about them. I just and try why, to, yeah. Why young people? Like, how did you land on this group of, of kids? Like, what works about young people as characters? Well, in general, they're so interesting to write about because their lives are in such transition. It's a, it's a constant state of flux for young people. And um, because everything is subject to change and nobody really knows exactly where they're headed, um, everything is magnified. All sort of emotions are escalated in a lot of ways. And the um, our sense of what is and isn't important and what matters is really kind of all over the place in the best possible way. And so one of the things that I really was thinking about a lot when everything started getting really politically complicated um, was what it must be like to be a young person now, right? To be someone who's only beginning to come into their own political activism during a time when political activism is, is becoming more of a way of life than just a thing that we sort of think about as part of our everyday existence, right? I mean, one of the things that I know a lot of us have been talking about in light of, of the election is that we, we would love to get back to a place where we just don't have to think about this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, where we can compartmentalize sort of the world's problems and our own problems a little bit more effectively. Um, but that's not where we were. And that's that's not where we were when I was writing. And I was like, what would it be like to be figuring out all of the normal things that like 15 and 16 year olds are figuring out about themselves and their world amidst all the complications that that exist now? It was hard to fathom in a way. And so I kind of wanted to write about it and see what would happen. It's a very elaborate fathoming that you do. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the, I mean, one of the great strengths, and I think one of the profound truths of the novel is that kids are deeply serious and engaged. And the kids in this book are so thoughtful and they're both extremely worried and extremely energized to make the situation better for themselves and for our generation who has you know, left them this catastrophic uh, world. But I wonder too about how you, juxtaposed in their lives what's most banal and what's most profound because it's one of my favorite elements of the book and often my favorite element of good fiction is the sort of um collaging of sort of the daily life of these kids with their most existential fears which of course echo our most existential fears it's like the end of civilization well yeah i mean one of the things that i i just couldn't help thinking about was the extent to which all of these things are vitally important to the lives of these kids. Um, and I don't want to say equally important because that's not quite right, but um, there's so much for them to be thinking about and to be focused on and to be obsessed with and to be worried about. And how do you prioritize? Like, I don't know how to prioritize that now. I certainly don't know how I would prioritize that as someone who is like having her first crush, right? How do you deal with the magnitude of the, kind of emotional responses you're having to other people that are part of the process of growing up. And then you're dealing with all of these sort of otherworldly, actual real world problems. Um, and I wanted all of the urgency of all of it to be part of the narrative, right? Um, but in a way I sort of wanted to not minimize the worldly part, but to put it in context and to make sure that it was clear that our everyday stuff still matters, right? Like it's no matter how ridiculous things are in the world, we're still but we are all still dealing with individual human problems. Um, sometimes those are in, you know, in, in some ways more important for us than the catastrophic things happening in the world. And sometimes they just need to be repositioned in a way. 
I mean, in a funny way, that's one of the great revelations of the novel. I mean, I don't want to spoil it because it's also kind of a huge page turner and the plot is very intricate and compelling. But the kids realize that, in fact, some of their larger fears are magnifications of fears about daily life and, you know, about love, right? Whom do we love? Absolutely. How do we love? What makes us lovable? Um, and so I'm curious too how you drew them. I mean, they, each of the each of the characters in this book has such a complicated set of sort of contradictions <laughs> that that mm -hmm. she or he or they uh, inhabits. And I'm I'm just curious how you made them up. Yeah, I wish I could remember better, right? Like it's it's been such an interesting and long process of working on this book. Um, I, you know, it, it and it started out as a very different novel um and it was originally going to be like a multiple perspective third person you know, like i really was do i wanted it to be um equally focused on all five of them right like, yeah. like i really wanted all five of them to be equally important and i tried to write it with all five point of views in play uh, which was incredibly helpful for getting to know them and sort of getting a sense of their backgrounds and who they were and what drove them and what they were scared of but it ultimately became impossible to get the book to move Right, that, that every scenario I kind of wanted to see from more than one person's perspective and I was lingering on things and it was awful. So once I had a narrator and I could filter things through Amina a little bit more, everyone else came into focus a bit better, even, even though I had been in their point of view when I was trying to write them initially. Um, so that's one piece of it, I guess. And then um, it's so, you know, I, I, I like to sort of joke about taking you know, characteristics or, or personality flaws that I have or things that I observe and making them kind of the central component of a character and then building them from there. Um, and it was fun to just sort of think about what interested me about people or what interested me about characteristics of people and then kind of build a character around it. And so each one of them had things going on that I was curious to explore. I don't want to say too much because some of the some of those things that I wanted to explore end up being pretty revelatory of how the plot plays out. But there were there were things I was curious about in terms of what everyone was afraid of and how that would manifest both as a worldly issue, but then in their own individual kind of personal lives, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And I mean, obviously revision is is a torment, right? And oh, yeah. I read this book at some point in manuscript form. It was already mm -hmm. very finely rendered and, and a great book. And then you changed it significantly over the course of yep. working on it. But I think what lingers in it, in those characters, is the sense that you have imagined each of those scenes from the perspectives of the kids. So mm -hmm. that, for example, just to be general, not to spoil anything, yeah. when the kids betray each other, it's not because some of them are mean and some of them right. are angels. It's because they have objectives and fears that cross, which to me is both true and politically important. Like it's important when you write teenagers to give each kid full humanity, full dignity, mm -hmm. and not to do the like mean girls doing mean things to each other because there's no such thing as mean girls. Right. There's just yep. kids who both, each kid needs something and like mm -hmm. they can't both have the things they need without betraying each other. So the betrayal in the book is also just really well done. I'm gonna ask a plot question without giving away the sure. plot. I mean, it's so elaborate. It, it, it's like a thriller, basically, the game. And I just mm -hmm. wonder at what point during the process you came up with that and how long it took to create it and whether you knew what the game was and how, how you made that game up in your own mind. Yeah, that, I mean, the, once I figured out the game structure, I figured out the book. Um, and so that yeah. was, that was a big piece of it. And I, you know, I had written the scene at the beginning where they have the game night and they meet each other through the game night. I had written that very early on in the process when it was still a different book. Um, and that ended up being the scene I kept coming back to. It was the one that didn't change that much um, from edit to edit. And even from reconception of the book on, it didn't change that much. Um, hmm. And so, there was something about that. There was something about the fact that they were getting to know each other through these games and that they were able to take a difficult sort of life question and expand it into getting to know each other through this game format, right? And, and once that was, once it was clear that that was fun for me, um, I started thinking about whether maybe that could be something that the club centered on, that rather than just strategizing, because originally, um, it was it was a lot of prepper stuff there i mean like i said there's been a lot of iterations of this book and in one of them they planned activities rather than games 
So there were traipses through the woods and there were all these other things. At one point, like I had the characters go to like a gun range. That was not an optimal way to handle things, but it was like I have this really fun scene that I wrote with them at a gun range. Um, they had done like a practice emergency triage thing when someone got injured. Like I had all these different ideas about survival tactics, but it was it was static because learning things is fun, but applying them is better, right? And so for them to just be figuring stuff, I mean, it's sort of like the way that we've been reconceiving of some of our classes in this mm -hmm. Zoom environment. And I think I have some faculty members here um, and a lot of us have talked about the ways that we always did, you know, exercises in class and group work and different things, but it's actually in a, in a Zoom environment that works beautifully and it works better than the explanation part. And we ended up moving a lot of the explanations offline um, and letting people do that part on their own and then doing the hands-on work in class. Um, and it's sort of the same thing I ended up doing with the book, that the, the learning of stuff was not where the fun was. It was the trying it out and the testing it. And the games became a way to test it. And then there became the competitive element. Um, and once you add competition, things can get really heated. So it was it was a long evolution. I mean, this book started out as um, I originally thought I was writing a book about someone who went missing on a college tour. Like that's how far we are from where this book started. Um, but I got interested in sort of the backstory, and then I got obsessed with what was happening in the world. And like this was the way to this was the way to work through it. Yeah, you you can feel that it was fun. I mean, it's it's a fun yeah, book to read. Fun. And it has, I mean, obviously it has very disturbing elements, but it also has a tremendous kind of sense of levity and and it it's often it's often just really fun. I also feel like the courage of the kids in preparing themselves for the the end of, of the world or trying to figure out how to survive is an important element. And one of the things I also want to talk about the book in the world before we before we open up for audience questions. But one of the things that um, one of the things I found like kind of surprising and edgy and interesting in this version of it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I read it like a year and a half ago a and then I read ago. it again now. And I thought, oh my God, it's gotten even more kind of precise and even more reflective of what's happening in the world. And it's kind of in conversation with our own fears and our own kind of worst demons. And one of the, one of those is the relationship between fear and rage. Mm -hmm. And there's a moment in the book when Amina says, like, I'm not scared, I'm furious. Mm -hmm. And I, I really admired that moment. I felt like she's figuring out who she is. She's willing to say the thing. And she's realizing that actually fear and anger are maybe inextricable. Anyway, I just wonder for you what the relationship is between fear and rage, both in, in real life, if there's mm -hmm. even such a thing anymore, and also in your work. <laughs> Well, I find that I, I think that for me, like, and I'm only sort of figuring this out as we talk about it more, you know, it's one of those things that you don't realize you've thought about until you try to articulate it. But fear for me is like a reflective part, a process, right? Fear is where you're sort of figuring out what the issues are and, and trying to understand and, and sort of working through the visceral emotional response. Um, rage is where you get things done. Rage, rage is where you are, um, you're able to take the things that scare you, but focus them into action in some way. Like when I'm angry, um, you know, setting aside the wanting to just like rant and rave and do whatever it is that we do. Like, I also usually want to do something. I want things to be different. Um, yeah. And in fear mode, I want to hide from that. In rage mode, I want to act on it. Um, and so to me, it was really important to sort of show that that was sort of the point of this club, right? That like fear, can be the basis for a discussion, but you sort of have to get worked up in order to make something happen. And this is a group of people who wanted to make things happen. And I mean, not too much of a spoiler to say that that's where this book is headed, right? It's headed to a place where they can act, where they can do things that they feel are actually productive, right? And I, 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 I'm, I'm loath to use that word because I know that for me, like the concept of productivity has taken on this very weird cast during the pandemic, but it's still a useful word in its way. Um, and and I, I, I sort of love the idea of anger being functional, right? Rather than just being this thing that um, that is a source of frustration, I want it to be a source of empowerment. It, I mean, it is. And for me, the most infuriating thing is powerlessness. 
the thing that makes me feel the most rage and that infuriates my characters, yeah. go figure, is a feeling of powerlessness, a feeling of not having agency, not being able to, to make things better or to say directly what you need said or ask directly what you need asked. And so one of the great beauties of the book is watching these kids figure out a way to, to, to power themselves and to kind of change the situation that they're in, um, in both real ways and imaginary ways that give them templates for further action. I think one thing we can say is instead of maybe instead of productivity, we can say like radical change or progress. Yeah. Like progress. the kids are radical. Yeah. Yeah. And okay, mm -hmm. so this is my final question before we talk about sure. giddy things like this cover. Mm -hmm. I wanna um, <laughs> I wanna talk about how contemporary this book is. And I don't just mean because it's kind of about the terrors yeah, right. that we're all facing, but like your, you know, your ability to be, um, contemporary and young in, in, in these characters and in their world. And you know that it's tremendous, inclusive, representative cast of characters. They listen to the music that, that young people actually listen to. They speak in a way that's absolutely credible and totally unpatronizing. And I just wonder, like, do you have access to your 15 year old self? And also like, do you do a ton of research? Like who, you know, who gives you the lyrics of the music they're listening to? Like, how do you access that, that, that stuff and make it so uh, plausible? I admire uh, it. I'm just curious how you put it together. I, I often joke that I never really matured past 17, which helps tremendously. That helps. <laughs> uh, I'm only half joking, right? Um, so that's one piece of it. I do, um, I tried, I mean, I, I'm not someone who's like in touch with actual teenagers all the time, but I do enjoy talking to them when I encounter them, such as your fabulous kids. Um, and I am constantly pleased to be reminded that um, if you treat like teenagers, like, you know, the sort of young adult humans that they are, um, then they treat you like an adult human and you can have a real conversation and learn tremendous things. Um, yeah. One of the things that enraged me most as a, as a kid was just not being taken seriously. Um, yeah, and the too. idea that just because I was, I was young and that I still had a lot to learn about a lot of things that I had deeply considered things and that I hadn't sort of fully contemplated difficult topics. And yes, I mean, I knew even at the time that I had things to learn, but like, I felt that I mattered. Um, and that's something that is still true. And I still feel like kids that age matter and their thoughts are really important to me. Um, and especially now when like, we've made a very complicated world for them to live in and we need them to be amazing. So we might yeah. as well treat them like they're amazing from the get go. Um, and then write books in which they're amazing and interesting and all of these things are, are true. I think the hard balance for me is um, writing about the world as I want it to be versus the world as it is, because neither of those are really the answer, but it's hard to know where to err, you know, which, which side of the line to, to balance on. And so it, I read a lot of young adult books because I wanna see not just, um, not just how kids talk, but how adults talk about kids, right? Um, and yeah. and the things that kids are reading, and it's a, it's a, it's a two-way conversation, right? It's it's everybody sort of being engaged in this process. And I find that sometimes, you know, you have these books where the kids just aren't given enough credit. You could totally see it on the page. Yeah. And I never want to read a book like that. Like that would be very upsetting to me if if someone said that I was condescending to young people in a book. That would be the most upsetting thing someone could say. I think. Um, but then to go too far and to, to make a world that doesn't really resemble where we are yet, I'm not ready mm -hmm. for that either. And there's some wonderful, like very sunny books that are set like, a little bit ahead of where I think we are. And I can't do that yet. I'm, I'm maybe in too dark a place to do that. And then Although the music I thing, I just got to look it up on the internet, right? <laughs> <laughs> that can't be true because in your other book, you're so brilliant about contemporary music as well. I mean, I would argue too that there there's a lot of hope in this book. It's an oxygenated mm -hmm. book and that in a way the world as you would prefer it and the world as it now looks, mm -hmm. it, the, teenagers who are able to to look at those two poles can also measure the distance between them. And it seems like to me that, that part of coming of age is figuring out how elastic those margins are and how how much you can use your rage to fuel movement from one pole to the other, from what the world looks like to what, what we want it to look like. I think of like the Parkland kids or something mm -hmm. and the just tremendous energized force in the world that those kids are. And they got that way by being analytical, 
by looking at the world and measuring it against the world they preferred and then trying to move us all toward that vision instead of the vision that was our quote unquote reality. I mean, of course, this circles back to our the beginning of our conversation because mm -hmm without imagining better situations and positive outcomes and characters who are all three-dimensional and human, how can, we, how can we get to those places? We have to imagine them, which is why novelists are saving the world. <laughs> See, this is why I wish you'd written this book. <laughs> That's why your book, I wish I'd written this book too, but I'm just grateful <laughs> to get to read it, you know? Um, no, I think I it's think a really hopeful point. book. Like, yeah, I, you know, it, there are so many conversations among YA writers about what are um, what are the characteristics of YA books? What are the responsibilities of writers? And all these different things. And one of the things that is is in flux right now, I think, is um, the idea that part of the definition of young adult literature is ending on a hopeful note of some kind, even if it's just a glimmer. That's that's something that I think people are willing to move away from now and are happy to see go in some ways in service of realism mm -hmm. or in service of sort of broadening the tent for YA writers. But I have to say for me, I need that. I, I need, it doesn't have to be a lot of hope. It doesn't have to be like a sunny ending, right? But I, I would not feel comfortable writing a book for teenagers that did mm -hmm. not show the promise of things improving upon adulthood. Right, like I just don't want to be the person who says um, how you have it now is as good as it will ever get. I, I I can't do that. That wasn't my experience, right? Like I was very excited to grow up. Um, some people don't like it as much. I was happy to become an adult and like sort of move away from kid stuff. Um, but just the idea that the world is so fraught with peril and terror that you should dread it, and and that's realistic. It may well be realistic, but I'm not going to be the one to write about that. Even under the dark, like I write a lot of dark stuff and there's still the glimmer. I, I have to have it. I think it's more than a glimmer in this book. And like, to me, <laughs> what, what makes, what makes it artificial is if you do all the dread in advance and then you land on the hope. Right. Yeah. But to me, hope and dread, it's like the profound and the banal we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. the immediate juxtaposition, the constant juxtaposition, hope, the twin of hope is dread. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you feel dread and you're doing that teenage thing we were talking about where you're measuring the distance between dread and hope you're also experiencing hope or you're imagining hope. And it seems to me that that's what the kids do throughout this book. And they do it not just about the world, not just about the political yep. topical issues, but about each other. Mm -hmm. about each other's best and worst intentions. And this is how they, and the, about their parents. I mean, there's that one fabulous surprise, which I'm not gonna give away. <laughs> but you know, one of the kids, we have this revelation about kind of who his parents are and, and what that means and mm -hmm. how he can kind of forge himself in opposition to the things about them that he's not able to tolerate, but also yep. be their child. And that's, that's a profound and difficult kind of movement through your life. And we all have to do it, right? Yeah. I mean, in a way, it's also a book about kids and their parents. That too. That too. I had a very funny conversation with my mom about that earlier today. <laughs> yeah. Tell us. Do tell. Um, no, but we, well, we sort of joke about about like me writing about parents in books, right? Because you know, mm -hmm. anyone that you write about that bears a a, a relationship. The, 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 when, when you write about someone in a book for whom you have a parallel relationship in real life, there's always the open question about whether you're writing about that person, right? And so my mom was joking <laughs> about about parents in the books and how I've sort of treated it. But if they're YA novels, so you sort of have to often complicate the relationship with the parents in some way, um, which is not at all about my parents in any sense. But one of the things I thought it was really important for Amina to recognize in this book is that she's extremely frustrated with her parents at the beginning because they are not reacting to the world the same way she is. Um, and right. they are making decisions that involve her life that, that are sort of, she perceives as coming from a very different place. Um, and it turns out that as she starts to get to know all these other people and learns about their family situations, she has a real you know, profound respect for her own family um, and she is able to appreciate them in a way that she wasn't before, which I thought was really important. You know, like we don't always see how great we have it um, until it's in relation to other things, right? Um, totally. And I like to think I've always known my parents were fabulous and wonderful, but like maybe I wasn't always as appreciative or effusive about it until I had a sense of what other people's home lives were like. Maybe I know I it filled me with hope about it now, right? <laughs> someday my kid, I was thinking someday my kids will thank me.
Yes. It reminds me of that the line in, in Ann Carson, this poet whom I love, her book Autobiography mm -hmm. of Red. She has this line where she says, up against another human being, one's own procedures take on definition. Mm -hmm. And it's fun to watch the kids in this book figure out who they are kind of in each other's, in e like as a, I almost think of it like, pe like Tetris shapes. They're kind of falling mm -hmm. together and fitting themselves into these patterns. And Amina's revelation about her family is one of the most beautiful aspects of the book. And of course her affection for her sister throughout is totally mm -hmm. lovely. We have a couple of questions in the chat, uh, in the question box, I'm gonna ask them. It sounds like the notion of game is central to the novel. Can you say more about what interested you about that for this project? Was it something about how games prompt strategic thinking or how they put people in conflict or how they cause tension between conflict and cooperation or something mm -hmm. else entirely. That's from Brandon uh, Fogel. <laughs> so, and just for context, right? Um, Brandon was my college roommate and we had, um, we would have a lot of conversations about like political strategy and politics. We were, we were roommates during a very tumultuous time politically. And then he's also someone who's very engaged in some very complicated games um, and is a very strategic thinker, right? And he mm -hmm. knows how much sort of strategy is of interest to me, right? Um, I think that games are such a useful way of figuring out things about ourselves, the world and other people. Um, and depending on how the game is constructed, you know, there is, um, there are many things that, that, that end up being revealed. And I hate to use passives, right? But there's so many different revelations taking place in so many different ways. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to find a way again, to like to activate the teens in this book rather than to have them be passive participants in, you know, what were just sort of isolated learning processes. And I wanted them to, again, like define themselves in relation to each other and learn about sort of how they, how they behaved, not when they were on their own, but when it mattered to other people. You know, one of the, um, one of the things in the book is Amina's where she's, her concern is like governmental collapse and all these things. But the way that it plays out is that um, her characters, the, 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 her friends have access to limited resources. And he's, she's basically created this environment where um, people, are gonna have a really hard time surviving alone. They're gonna to have to team up and they're gonna to have to strategize and figure things out. And it comes out during this game that some people are better at that than others in both good and bad ways. And that to be good at strategizing and to be good at engaging with other people also leaves open the possibility for manipulation. Um, and I, I'm interested in the complexity of that and the ways that the games reveal these things about the characters and their relationships with one another. Um, and just as an aside, you know, one of the TV shows that I've been the most obsessed with lately is The Queen's Gambit. Um, and that is a game that theoretically is about, um, it's a TV show that's about a strategy game that ostensibly is between two people, right? But it turns out that the show makes clear that there are many other people involved at every stage and that games are never quite what you think they are and they never, the, the parameters of them are not always what they appear to be. And that's something that I thought was important to play with and also fun. I don't know if that's responsive to the question, but you know. It's a great response to the question. And it's funny because if I were an English teacher, which I am, I would say that the game also feels meta. You know, it feels mm -hmm. to me like a conversation about fiction about kids trying things out. You know, our shared yep. students, our beloved students at UChicago often ask mm -hmm. about the writer's life and the question of whether you have to have a tormented, tragic life in order to be a writer. And I'm lately so glad to be middle-aged because I can mm -hmm. say and know that it's true. No, actually, no. <laughs> you, can you can quarantine your, your worst impulses and fears in your work. Mm -hmm. And that's how you work them out. You kind of ask the questions that you're most afraid to find the answers to by way of writing. And it feels to me like you're doing that in this book and the kids in the book are doing that with their game. Yeah, and I was explicitly doing that in this book. I mean, like I was a mess when I was writing it. Like, you know, just the world is a disaster and I was freaking out and like be not being able to write it. I mean, I was finishing my last book as the election was happening. Um, and my last book did not engage with the political world at all. It was a very, you know, personal family close narrative. It had its own mystery, but it was not a mystery that was particularly engaged with what was happening politically. Um, and it was incredibly hard to finish it and promote it in that environment. Um, and I, I wanted to write about what was happening, but I didn't know how. 
right? And I'm having the same problem now, you know, in a different way, but like we are living in such complicated times that it's it, it feels for me really difficult to like pretend they're not happening in our fiction, right? But at the same time, I do not have the knowledge or perspective or wisdom to really help people with a lot of this. Um, but what I can do as a writer is ask questions and have my characters ask the questions and struggle with the answers and have some of the answers be wrong and have some of the answers be helpful, even if they're not right. Um, and that process of asking those questions and puzzling through it with them was very sort of therapeutic for me as we worked through all the things that we were working through. Yeah. Totally. You know, James Baldwin has this beautiful idea in one of his, I mean, he has many beautiful ideas, but there's a Paris Review interview with him from like 1984. And he's talking about the difference between preaching and writing. Mm -hmm. And he basically says, when you're preaching, you have to arrive at the pulpit already with a conclusion, which you need to convey to your congregants. You have to have reached something, you know something. And when you're writing, it's the opposite. And in fact, not only do you not know the thing that you're pursuing, you also kind of don't want to know. It's something mm -hmm. that you don't want to find out, but something compels you to keep asking. Mm -hmm. And I often use that as a way of thinking about not, I mean, we have this cliche in our culture, right? Write, write what you know. But I think it, it's obvious that we don't read what we know, right? We read right. what we wonder. And I think actually we largely write what we wonder. And even the even your description of the kind of the way in which you came to this final version of the book is really about wonder and intellectual mm -hmm. curiosity and political curiosity as engines, not some kind of pedantic yep. decision on which you had already settled. I, I, you know, I always want to recast the right what you know, because it's such a, it's like an ostensibly useful thing that has been perverted to very unhelpful ends, <laughs> you know? I, and so I, 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 I often think of write what you want to know and then write what you can yeah. imagine, right? Like, and those yeah, two exactly. things, like the space between what you, what you're interested in and what you can conceptualize, a lot lives in that space. And I think there's a lot yeah. that you can do with, with the work there. Um, yeah, no, that James Baldwin stuff, the quotes are amazing and it's true. And, and it, it, there's, there's some, I know there's some of my mystery writer friends here and we talk a lot about this in terms of how much you know going in when you write a novel contains an element of mystery in some way. Um, and there are some mm -hmm. of us who need to know a lot about where things are headed in advance so that we can lay it out. And then there are some of us who are like, there's a mystery and at some point, like, it'll, we'll figure it out, you know? Um, and I find I've been both, you know, I have now written four books where, you know, sometimes I knew who the bad guy was at the beginning and sometimes I didn't. Sometimes mm -hmm. I knew who the bad guy was, but I didn't understand the motives. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, you know, sometimes I just had no idea. And then the, I mean, I know it sounds so cheesy to say this, but like the book kind of told me, like I had written, like my first book, I had written the bad guy in without knowing who the bad guy was. But I went <laughs> back and reread my draft and I was like, it's very obvious who the bad guy is, <laughs> you know? And it, it, it's fascinating to me. Like your brain is doing all this behind the scenes work as you're thinking about these things uh, because we we're writing what we want to know and we're writing what we can imagine, you know? And, and we might not and even And sometimes know, what we're afraid know. to know. Yes. That's Actually, true. there's a question in the in the chat thread about bad guys. Now <laughs> seems like a good time to pose it. And the question is about intention. Is it intentional that your characters are riddled with moral ambiguity? This is Tom asking. Hi, <laughs> yeah. Tom. Uh, the villain is still yeah. regarded with a sort of sympathy and empathy for being uh, fucked up rather than despised for being evil. Mm -hmm. Is this a misconception on my part? Is it because you recognize that's true because they're human? Yeah, no, it's bad extremely... villains, good heroes. Yeah, extremely purposeful. Um, and to me, like something that's very important for me is to remember that in every book that I'm writing, every single character is the hero of their own book, right? Like I just happen to be writing about one character over another at any given time, but I always am exploring in my head what this book would be if it were from a different point of view or if the focus were on a different character. Um, I'm I'm like you in that I just don't, the whole like, they're just a mean girl or they're just a bad person. That's not right. really a thing, right? Um, I really believe that everyone is acting with intentionality in some way based on a completely different set of underlying assumptions and understandings than what we might think they have, right? And so I, even in these sort of difficult circumstances, I find myself wanting to imagine the life that led a person to behave the way that they do and to find that an acceptable 
approach, right? Um, and I will admit, right now I'm struggling, right? There, there are people who are behaving in ways in the world that I, I cannot get my empathy brain around. Like it's just, the, that's the limits of how much empathy I have. Um, but for the types of characters I'm writing about, I have yet to find even a villain, even the worst villain, who is not behaving in a way that is completely comprehensible to them, um, to the extent that that's possible, and that has a moral logic in their in the world as they see it. Right. Right. Like there's a reason that they're doing something that isn't just like an abstract bad thing to some other character. It's that character is doing something that makes complete sense to them even if other people don't see it the same way. And I think that's important. And I try to get that out where I can. I mean, nuance is the core of fiction, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't, you can't have the polls be so, you know, be sim oversimplified or it becomes propaganda. I mean, more and more, I think that kind of answering the, the questions should be left to the, or, or pro pro providing simple answers to the questions should be left to the propagandists mm -hmm. and that the work of creative writers is really asking and complicating those questions. And yep. so it becomes not so much even about whether characters' behaviors are forgivable or redeemable or are God forbid likable, which I've actually banished That's the word the likable word. from my yeah. class it's and so the word unhelpful. relatable. Mm -hmm. like, Ugh, likable and relatable question. are the worst. The question is compelling. Like what makes a character compelling and usually that has to do with motive and it has to do with the nature of a character forcing that character to make the choices that she or he or they end up making mm -hmm. and we want to watch why people behave the ways they do not not so much judge whether what they do is good or bad i mean you know humpert humpert is not a forgivable character no. And yet everybody has read Lolita for forever. Um, you, there's a question about, is it easier to extend the kind of sympathy and empathy that we're talking about to YA characters, the teenagers within the YA world? Do you think? That's Amelia asking. No, I, hi, yeah, Amelia. No, hi, Amelia. I, it's, it's, I don't know. I, like, I don't, I feel like that's one that I don't have an intuitive response to, right? Because on the one hand, yes, in that for many of the teens that I'm writing about, um, their life experience is limited enough that I can at least sort of circumscribe where they're coming from in my brain, right? Like I can sort of understand enough about the whole of their experience to get a sense of where they're coming from. But I will say that's partly a function of the characters I'm writing, right? Like there are certainly, you know, teens who have much more complicated lives than I'm contemplating in these books. Um, and then, you know, the thing about the adults is they have a lot of other stuff going on, right? And they have a lot more lived experience to sort of factor in. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's harder to write about them. I think it's just a different set of questions that we ask about them. And um, it, it also takes a different approach. Like we, we have to think about empathy a little differently in relation to them um, because they're a little closer to where we are right now. But I, I think it's complicated no matter what. And I would yeah. say it's never easy, right? Like it, it's it, the, the, the empathy act is work, right? Like I, I don't, I don't think that this whole concept of like being intuitively empathetic or whatever is, is all that useful. I think that empathy is something that we constantly have to be learning and relearning and working to improve and like struggling against what we perceive our own limits to be. You know, like I, I, I find I joke about this a lot about, you know, reaching the limits of my empathy on X thing or another, but that's a real, it's a real struggle for me is, is, you know, banging into the places where I have an intuitive response that is not particularly empathetic and then figuring out whether I am interested in doing the work to move past it. Because sometimes I am and then sometimes it's just too hard. Because empathy is an intellectual project as well. Mm -hmm. It's not just a feeling and right. it's not it's not the same as sympathy, right? Sometimes empathy is just the ability to imagine the life of a human being who isn't you. To put yourself in, in a perspective that's not your perspective. And you know you do that over and over uh, in this novel, and it's very clear that that not everybody is the protagonist, and yet each of the characters is the protagonist of his or her their own story. People want to know what you're writing next. Oh, Everybody's God. already chomping at the bit for your next book, even though it's Bob Day for this book. Are you working on another YA, Rebecca Johns? I, Hi, Rebecca Johns. I mean, I, I have to say, Becky knows exactly how hard this question is to answer. Um, I have had like sort of a list of projects in the, you know, theoretically in the, like, I, I usually like to have something in the works before a book is, is done 
or an idea that's like germinating so that I can move from one project to the next because I, I am not in a happy place when I'm not writing, even though like writing is hard and I'm not saying I'm like sitting around super happy writing. I'm usually just enraged and furious and frustrated, but like at least I have something to direct it at and something to work on. Um, and I will say this pandemic just like completely derailed me, right? Like yeah. the, the project that I was planning on working on next um, was set at a summer camp and like, that was just not a thing I could be writing about this summer. The idea of like a summer camp while we were all under this like crazy quarantine, that was not a thing. So that book got put aside. Um, and then there was like a mystery novel I was thinking about, but that got put aside. Like I just couldn't, I couldn't get to a place where the pandemic didn't matter to the book, right? Because yeah. I can't write about this yet. I'm not ready to write about it yet. Um, but I know that it's going to leak into whatever comes right like the 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 insularity and the sort of claustrophobia and frustration that i think we all have with these circumstances um they have to come out somehow but i can't do it in realism and i'm not a fantasy writer so it took me a right. very long time to get to the place where i even had an idea <laughs> my friend from camp is very annoyed at me because I promised her the next I, book was going to be the camp book. I swore it would be the camp book and I can't do it. So so what I'm working on now is very, very nascent. I literally started it like a week ago and this is a terrible time to start a new book. Um, but it's sort of a locked room mystery set in my local cemetery. Um, and what that does for me is it gives me sort of that weird not exactly claustrophobia, claustrophobia, where they're in a very open space that they can move around in, but they can't go anywhere, right? Um, so I can explore that. Um, it, yeah. I can keep it, it's, it's a one night event. And so I can kind of keep it away from this timeline and have that not be the focus, you know? Um, it is very much mystery and I am focusing only on the mystery elements right now. I am not trying to think about any ways this mystery hits the world and I'm sure that'll leak in as we go, but it doesn't have to yet. Um, and I am going to try to do that multiple point of view, have lots of people matter thing. And that's going to be difficult and frustrating in ways that will be um, hopefully energizing for my writing. So it's, it's a, so it's interesting a to hear you talk about that. <laughs> Sorry, which I feel part? like it's. I found it so interesting to hear you talk about it, especially the kind of um, the timeline part. I think writers are so often working on our projects and then also their opposites. Mm -hmm. Like I know that the timeline was very difficult to pin down mm -hmm. um, in How to oh, Pack, yeah. and I, I, I feel like even the kind of it's going to happen over one night, and I'm going to do the mm -hmm. thing with the multiple characters, which you know didn't happen. It just gives me the reassuring sense that like you're working on a large body of work and these books end up in conversation <laughs> okay. with each other, which is what the goal is as a writer, right? And to keep kind of moving your own mind forward and making your work kind of ask the new questions. Like some of those seem to me anyway, to be the questions that remained for you after this book mm -hmm. was finished that didn't finally make their way into this book. And so maybe that's a way to liberate yourself from thinking about, you know, how COVID <laughs> and how the pandemic actually worked their way. And as you know, I, I, I'm really struggling to write fiction in this moment as well for oh, the yeah. same reason. It's like either hideously topical or like your book that was set in 2019 might as well be set in the 17th century. <laughs> like it, it's such a weird and defining thing and yet we don't have any certainty about it. So it becomes very hard to have any perspective. I wanna mm -hmm. talk about the cover before we're yes. done. Because, oh my God, it's such a great cover. They did and such I, I want to know how they? they did it and what you thought when you got it. I want to hear that story. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, so for this book, I have a different editor than I had for the first three. And uh -huh. the, like for the first three, we had sort of gotten into a rhythm and there was a process and like things had just gone a certain way. And because that was all I knew, um, I thought that's how it was, right? And so my previous editor had sent me covers and been like, what do you think of them? And they were amazing. And so I said they were amazing and then it was over, right? There wasn't really much of a conversation to be had, right? For this one, the editor sent me two different um, artist design ideas in progress, right? And so she invited me to sort of be part of the process rather than evaluating a potential cover right um and the the two designs were very very different and this one was the one that spoke to me um but it went through many many evolutions that i got to see and comment on which was fascinating and like 
you know, on the one hand, I'm not a visual person and I'm not a, you know, a graphic designer and I don't know a lot about color theory and all these different things and, you know, what makes something look 3D versus not. Um, but it was surprising how many opinions I had <laughs> when I saw right. things and, and that they, I had reasons for them. You know, once I sort of pressed on it and tried to figure out, okay, why am I reacting to this versus something else? Um, there turned out to be reasons all the time and they respected the reasons, which was wonderful. And so I felt like I got to collaborate in the process of putting this together a little bit. Um, and it was super fun. And by the end of it, it was down to what color the background should be, that it was all done. And it was a question of whether the background was gonna be blue or red. And I could not, like they both were great. And that was, and so then I could just be like, you know what, let the experts decide. And they chose red and I think they, they were right. It was fabulous. I have loved I like your description of them listening to you. It reminds me of your description of your teenage self being taken seriously by adults. <laughs> oh my God, that's <laughs> totally right. <laughs> it's evidence for your your theory that you still contain your 16 year old self. Oh my God, it's so the cover is really iconic. It feels um it feels very distilled and, and dangerous and interesting. I like it a lot. I think it's a very, very good cover. And yeah, the book is totally marvelous. Well. And it's 7 p.m. Do, are we, do no. we have to let everybody leave the bookshop? That was an hour. It went so fast. That was very, very quick. That was much quicker than I was expecting. <laughs> that was such an amazing conversation. Thank you both. Um, I just, the admiration that you have for young people is so obvious, the respect you have um, for you so deeply in this conversation and in this book. I loved every minute of listening to the two of you. Um, it flew by. Um, if you haven't bought the book, here it is, this beautiful book. It is um, available for purchase um, from Women and Children First. Um, and thank you so much, both of you, for letting us get away for a little while and just listening to two brilliant women talk about the importance of fiction. So thank you both. Have a thank you so much for hosting this. You know, it has been like such a joy to live in a neighborhood with a bookstore this amazing and to know that I can just walk down the street and be someplace as wonderful as your store. And I understand today is a birthday, right? It is. is that true? Yes, today is a how many years? Forty-one years. So amazing. Yeah. And we wouldn't be here without local authors like the two of you supporting us through the years. So we we so deeply appreciate your your support for all this. Thanks so much for doing this and thanks to everyone for being here. I'm gonna hang out and just play in the chat room for a while if that's still open, just so I can say hi to everybody because it's like being at a party and not getting to talk to all the all the guests. <laughs> that I think is the hardest part about virtual events is we all wanna go out for a glass of wine mm -hmm. afterwards and we can't. So it feels Someday. Like feel free to hang out in the chat um also we'll be recording this event this event was recorded and it will be uploaded to our youtube channel tomorrow so if anyone would like to use this video for your creative writing classes um it'll be there um thank you all and have a wonderful night thank you so much and thank you rachel for doing this i'm so grateful it was an honor and a joy congratulations on your beautiful novel happy birthday women and children first i love you happy birthday we love you. Bye. Bye.